Welcome to the Work Camper Show, brought to you by WorkCamper.com. This podcast helps you discover how to finance your RV travel dreams. Each one of our episodes will introduce you to people who are already living the RV lifestyle or to work camping opportunities all around the U.S. You'll also learn how to hit the road the right way and make the most of every opportunity. Now let's turn over today's show to your host, Greg Gerber. Today I'm interviewing a woman from Ohio who found her niche by work camping at wildlife refuges around the country. Their beautiful location she's helping to preserve for future generations to enjoy. Today's episode is sponsored by Work Camper News. With its diamond and platinum membership tools, Work Camper News is much more than just a job listing website. When you put the tools of this professional service into action, you'll find out just how easy it can be to turn your work camping dreams into reality. The one-year memberships open the door to a one-stop shop for all things work camping. Being the original resource for work camping, you'll find the largest number of job listings, be able to connect with the community of work campers, and view resources compiled by experts who've been enjoying the RV lifestyle for many years. If you're serious about leading a successful and enjoyable work camping lifestyle, then a Diamond or Platinum membership is for you. You can even get started with a free 30-day trial by visiting www.workcamper.com forward slash trial. Embark on new adventures today with the support of Work Camper News behind you. Heather Spain is from Ohio. She and her husband started RVing in 2014, even though they knew he had cancer because they wanted to make the most of his remaining time. When her husband died in 2017, she continued the adventure in their fifth wheel and with their black lab. She has worked a variety of jobs, such as the sugar beet harvest and at private campgrounds. Then Heather started volunteering at state parks and with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Today she hops around the country working at wildlife refuges for a few months before Hitch Hitch settles in and she wants to move to a new location. The best part about volunteering is that Heather can almost always find a place to work wherever she wants to travel, and the organizations she helps are very grateful for her service. To tell us more about her work camping experiences and why she loves RVing as a single woman, please welcome Heather Spain to the show. Thank you for joining me today, Heather. I really appreciate the time. How long have you been RVing? Oh, well, there was a long period of time when I was young. We went out in our little Scotty trailer every summer for years. So that counts. And then lately, about 12 years. About 12 years in this stint. And what kind of RV do you have? I have a fifth wheel. Why why did you select that? Oh, it's so much easier to tow. And uh, I'm full-time. Some of my questions might be skewed to that full-time status. Mm -hmm. Meaning I don't have a sticks and bricks anywhere. I live wherever I park and everything I own is in my trailer. Okay. So size was a big option there. And then just... It's easy to tow, easy to sit up, just easy. You're all around. And it turned out to be a better deal for me to not buy a tow vehicle, you know, to to drive with a class A and tow a small car. It's turned out better because, you know, once you're down, you're down. Mm -hmm. If you have a truck and an RV parked, you can go wherever you need to go. That's a very good point. And you don't have a problem backing the, the fifth wheel or towing it anywhere? No, not at all. Okay. It's once you get it, you've got it. Are Sometimes you, it takes a minute, but once you get it, you've got it for the rest of your life. Are you a solo work camper? I am okay. for the last five years. My husband died in 17. Oh, over. Yeah, it was cancer and we knew it before we started out, but that was part of the reason we did it. There you go. That's a very good point because you never know what the future is going to hold. And if you'd waited, then you would have missed out on a bunch of experiences. Oh, and he waited too. He waited too long. We mm-hmm. should have started this years before. <laughs> How long have you been work camping? Have you been doing it the entire time you've been RVing? We left in 2014. We Our first destination was Sturgis, of course, for the 75th. <laughs> and uh, since you're up there, I wanted to work sugar beet harvest. So that was the first thing I did. Sturgis is in August, of course, and sugar beet starts in late September, October. That was my first work camping job. And then I kind of pedaled around and then... Just took off from there. What attracted you to this lifestyle? Well, it was Paul. Um, I was this was his bucket list. He wanted this is what he wanted to do. He'd never traveled, so I had traveled when I was young, and he'd never had. So he said, "We're buying an RV and taking off when I retire." And he ended up retiring a little early, so that's what we did. And I quit my perfectly good job to do this. 
because he wasn't old enough to retire. I wasn't quite old enough. What did but you do? That's what we did. So cough. What did you Just, do for a career? Oh, uh, well, I bartended most of my life. And then for the last two, oh, 10 years or so, I ran a fork truck. Really? In a grocery warehouse. I know, how polar. <laughs> One sounds like it'd be really outgoing and around a lot of people, and the others seem to be, you know, kind of on your own, doing your own thing. Right. I, you know, I like to say I've paid my dues with the public. <laughs> there you go. I did. I spent 30 years in hospitality, and then I kind of just, now I kind of keep to myself. What do you like most about the RVing and work camping experience? Oh, where you go. Man, it's never the same twice. Mm-hmm. You know, you meet new people, new types of people, I new cultures. I just, every, it's always different. And there's just almost infinite places to go. I mean, you go up to Michigan in the summer, you go to Arizona in the winter, you go down to Florida in the fall. I mean, you can go anywhere. What are some of the favorite places the, you visited? Michigan's a big favorite for me, just because it's just so beautiful. There's so much wilderness up there. Been a lot of time in Texas. I mean, you can go back and forth in Texas and hit all four different zones. Yes. Is, you, know, you can pretty much spend the rest of your life in Texas if you don't watch out. Those are probably my top two. Colorado, of course, is beautiful. I like New Mexico a lot. It sounds like, have you been to all 48 lower states? I have. And if they, if they ever make a bridge to Hawaii, I'll drive there. <laughs> That's the only state missing on my bucket list as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I've heard it's not so great. Is that right? That's what I've heard. My friend moved there oh, and I've, she moved back I've heard a year later. Really expensive to live there. It was. And she said it was kind of hostile, not being a native. Okay. That's but, fair but enough. But hey, good enough to visit. I'll be there. Mm -hmm. And where are you from originally? I'm from Ohio, right, right. in the middle of the Buckeye State. <laughs> That's a nice state to be from. OH. Yeah. Do you have plans to return there after you're done? Mm, I'm not going to be done. You're never. Okay. No, this is it for me. This is my life now. I have a son there uh, and a mother-in-law there. And so I visit, but I have no plans to be anywhere permanently until I can't do this anymore. That's great. What kind of jobs have you held? Well, I mentioned the sugar beet harvest. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I worked for a couple of private campgrounds. And mostly I started working because I was just bored. Paul always, all he wanted to do was fish. I don't fish. I was bored. That's why I went to work. So I worked for some private campgrounds and didn't so much like that. And then started volunteering for state parks. So everywhere we went, I found a state park. We stayed for free. He got to fish. I worked my 27 hours a week. Everybody was happy. So you were just working for the state parks for a free RV site pretty much. Yep, free free RV hookup utilities, 20-some hours a week. Totally volunteer. Okay. After the work camping, work camping for money, sure beats for money, but it's not worth it. Are you doing a lot of volunteer jobs now? Yes, that's that's all I do now. I was, I'm, I'm blessed to have a little bit of an income from after we sold everything and got a CRV, so I have enough to live on. Oh, I don't worry too much about that. It is a relatively affordable if you don't travel a lot. If you do like work camping does, where you're working in a specific area for a number of months, rather than traveling Correct. every couple of days like I did, that was ungodly expensive. So that's Oh, no. Yes. Even even going from like the last trip, when I went from one side of Texas to the other was almost $800. Right. And diesel, because diesel was so expensive. So, you know, this way I, I go somewhere, I sit for three months. I just pay no rent, no utilities, no propane, and there you go. And it sounds like as a volunteer at the state parks, you the, the stints aren't nearly as long as it is when you're working for private campgrounds. Is that true? That is in general, yes. And it's they usually like you for a whole season. Whereas, you know, I call it hitch itch, where I get tired of being in one place too long. I get this hitch itch and I want to move after about three months. Hitch itch. I want to get up and go. Uh -huh, I you like love that? It. I love it. I've never <laughs> heard that before. <laughs> I didn't make it up, but I'll take credit for it. Okay. Super. What are you doing right now? Right now I'm volunteering for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I work in the wildlife refuges across the United States. Okay. So you're just bouncing around from one refuge to another. That's it. And what's so special about those kind of jobs? Uh, 
Ooh, it's hard to say where to start. With with campgrounds, there's a lot of rules because you're dealing with a lot of people. With the refuge system, you're pretty out, pretty much out stuck in 64,000 acres of wilderness that you have to maintain. <laughs> you really don't have to deal with the public too much. I love that. Second, I love that they trained me. I now have heavy equipment training. So I drive around on tractors and skid steers and backhoes and do things like that instead of walking around cleaning campsites. Well, that is a different work camping experience. It sure is. And that's, that's why I thought uh, we would enjoy talking with each other because it's, I try and get people to look into this all the time because they always say, oh, I'm so tired of campgrounds and so tired of cleaning up after people. Come to Fish and Wildlife. It's great stuff. So when you're working at the Fish and Wildlife campgrounds, you're operating this heavy equipment, what kinds of things are you doing with that? Mm. Well, first of all, there's hardly any refuge has a campground. Very rarely will you see a refuge with a campground. And if it is, then it's very primitive. Okay. So I don't, there's no such thing as camping in a refuge, really. Some of my projects this summer involved, oh, I dug up culverts that were broken on several roads, and then I repaved the roads. And then, what else did I do? Oh, I painted, just finished painting part of the visitor center. Those are some, some of the bigger projects I did. Um, before the hunt season comes, I go all the way around the perimeter with skid steer, picking up deadfall. It's pretty much whatever needs to happen, just happens. What are some of the perks you get to enjoy in that job? Well, having your backyard be 60,000 acres, that's one big one. <laughs> that's a big one. You pretty much walk out the decor and you're in, you're, you're out there. Uh, utility, I mean, I work 24 hours a week. All my utilities are paid. They buy my propane. Sometimes they even feed me. You, <laughs> you never know. It's just learning about all the different environments around here. Like all just the different kinds of zones and the plants and things. That's just another big perk. And really and pretty. Course, mm -hmm. Oh, it's gorgeous. No matter where you are. I mean, in the desert, it's pretty. In the country, you know, it's just pretty everywhere. Just different pretties. 24 hours a week seems to be relatively easy to do for somebody. Does that give you a lot of time to explore the area, I would imagine? Oh, yeah, it's a piece of cake. And the great thing about, well, with me anyway, and most of the refugees I work in, I don't have a schedule. They hand me a list and keys and say, here's, here, here's this. So they don't care when I work. So I can work, I could work three, eight hour days if I want, and then take four off. Well, that's it's pretty nice. much up to me. It is nice because you're not, you know, you're not scheduled to do certain things at certain times, unless there's a project or something. So nobody's course, really breathing down your neck, it sounds like. They do not micromanage you. Are you the only work camper at the re reserve? I was uh, until a month ago, and then another couple came in. No, they came in in October, and then they just left recently. Okay. But so I'm by myself again, but I'm about ready to move on. <laughs> Where are you going to go next? Uh, down to the Texas coast. Texas coast. That'll be fun. That'll be a, that's the beauty of Texas, right? You can be in oh. all four climate zones at the same time <laughs> within oh, yeah. a couple of hours of each other. Desert, coast, tiny woods, yep, it's all there. And will you be working for Fish and Wildlife there as well? I will. Yes, I will. But it'll be another refuge, one that I've never been to before, so that's kind of exciting. And how far from the coast is it? Uh, it's right, pretty much right on the coast. Oh, that would uh, be It's near nice. Lake Jackson. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, so most of that down there is 20 minutes to the beach. Mm -hmm. And when you're parking at the refuge, you're getting the free RV site and the free utilities, but no pay. Correct. The, we sold our house and okay. had a couple other things. And there was his savings and I had savings. And we kind of just come and everything and believe me, I'm cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really, I pay like four bills a month. I live so cheap. It's unbelievable. <laughs> that is nice. And somebody told me it's possible to do that in RVing if you don't have any debt. Would you agree with that? I agree, because I don't. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you don't worry about it. There's nothing you got to pay every month except I pay insurance, insurances, phone bill, but I don't have, everything else is paid for, thankfully. Have you faced any challenges on the road? Oh, there's lots. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge with this is the maintenance. 
there is always something in an RV that needs attention. Always. I mean, you get periodic maintenance, which you got to keep up on. So that, that's the challenge is you always got to learn new stuff. And you always got to get online, and figure out how to fix something. Did you take any training or courses on how to fix an RV? No, I didn't because I'm, I'm pretty handy anyway. So I wasn't really worried about it. And I have basic mechanical skills and I certainly have the tools. So I just when I don't know, I YouTube it. <laughs> or I also belong to several Facebook RV repair groups. So where you can throw out, hey, this is my problem. And people will answer, hey, this what that happened to me too. And here's what I did. Where did you pick up all that training and those tools? Is it j jobs you've had over the years? Actually, yeah. Much to my family's disappointment, I went to trade <laughs> school right after high school instead of college because I was interested in auto racing. So I went to auto mechanic school. That's cool. I think that the, was, a, yeah. The trend is going back to that, is what it appears I to think be. It is. What I hear on, or see people talking about on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're saying the college debt is just still unaffordable, for people, but trade pays you until you can't do it anymore. What are some of the challenges that you've had with your RV? Uh, just like I said, the basic maintenance, something falls off, or like my toilet blew up. I had to fix <laughs> things like that. The other thing that's tough, and nobody thinks about this because everybody travels in couples. Man, navigating by yourself is a pain. <laughs> yes, it is. You drive through, you've driven through Dallas. Okay, you go through Dallas with a 40 foot RV on the back. I mean, it's just, oh. I use the trucker app, so it helps, but still. What do you do for fun? Oh, lots of stuff. I have a little inflatable kayak, so I can go kayaking. My dog enjoys swimming along beside me. Do a lot of hiking. Do a lot of just sitting outside. I work outside, and I come home, and I just sit outside. Nice. and My dog, there's nobody around, so my dog doesn't have to be on a leash or anything. And she obeys. She's very smart. What kind of dog do you I'm have? Just, I have a lab, black lab. Oh, those are nice dogs. She's a very, very good dog. She is a volunteer camp dog. A <laughs> volunteer camp dog. She does. She finds trash. I swear. Okay, super. And you don't have to, <laughs> to, because they're not a campground there, you really don't have to worry about her interacting with other people. Nope. The guys I work with, they all love her. So no problem there. But there's no actual public that comes into where I live. I live back off in the refuge. So nobody comes to even visit the refuge and spend time there? Oh, yes, they do, but they, they don't come to where I live. Okay. Evo, yes, everybody. That's what we that we were lying on that. Hundreds of people. They come to the refuge, and there's no fee at this particular refuge. So, you know, and there's a nice auto tour, and right now all the waterfowl is in. We've got thousands, eight or 10,000 snow geese down here. Very <laughs> popular refuge for birding here. A lot of people don't realize that there is some spectacular beauty in those kind of out-of-the-way places. They simply migrate toward these big tourist attraction kind of things. And if they really want to get away from it all, they should look at spending time in these refuges. Absolutely. There's a, down near Brownsville, there's Laguna Hades Costa. And it is a, the last refuge for ocelots in Texas. They estimate the population is about 60, maybe. Mm -hmm. Beautiful refuge. Beautiful. But there's also a couple of state parks around that area. Everybody goes to state parks. We just I I interviewed somebody the other day who was into bird watching and is also from Texas, lives in the San Antonio area. And they were talking about how the state seems to be the home for migratory birds. At their oh, yeah. We're coming up north, path. going south. Yes. Yep, runs right through Rockport. You know, that's where the Hummingbird Festival is. And yeah, you know, it's just, you can, you can, you could set a calendar by the birds. How often are you moving to new locations or uh, new opportunities? Every three months, pretty much. Just about every three months. Okay. If you've already been to all 48 states, what's still on your bucket list? Well, I haven't been to the refuges in all 48 states. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Super. That's, that's pretty much, I'm just going to do this. And, you know, I, I've got the heavy equipment journey. So when I get too old and feeble to dig ditches anymore, I can just sit on my rear end in a skid steer and do work. Have you been work camping in Alaska? I have not. I have been twice, but I have never work camped there. Okay. 
I'll how, get there. How far in advance do you plan your trips or do you start looking uh, for jobs? A couple of, I don't know, three, four months in advance. Okay. Since I, since I work in a very, I'm kind of dedicated to staying with refugees. Basically, I just call where I want to go and I say, hey, uh, can you use me? I'm blah, 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 certified and blah, 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 blah. And I'll be there in June for three months and they either say yes or no. And that's all it is. I don't have to deal with the resume or anything anymore. It's very easy for me. Oh, that's very nice. And so even, yeah, well, even if it's busy or they don't have any st thing for you to use, would they recommend that you come back in a specific time? Oh, they might. I mean, if they don't have anything to do, I don't want to go there anyway. I can't stand being bored. <laughs> I want you to give me this giant list of projects to do and let, let me get busy. But if you don't have anything, you're just humoring me. I just rather, there's always somebody who needs extra help. If you had to start over again, would you do anything differently? Yes. I would have made him start earlier and retire earlier for one thing, because he only got three years on the road. That's it. Oh, it's, just, it's so sad. I mean, the three of the happiest years of his life, I'm pretty sure, but still. Second, I would have bought a bigger RV. I would have done more research and bought a bigger, because you don't realize how hard it is to get away from someone who wants to watch TV when you want to read a book in an RV. It's not like a house. That's a good point. You know, some of the RVs are built for zoned living like that, but not all. No. And I mean, with mine, I could go upstairs and shut the door if, you know, but still, it's just do your research before you go out. I didn't do very good research and we only bought a, we bought a 30 foot travel trailer the first time and turned out not to be a very good brand and it turned out to be a little too small. So those are two big things I would do. How big is your RV now? It's 40 feet. 40 feet for a single person. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Well, you have a black lab, so that's like two people, right? It's two people, right? <laughs> it costs more than I know. Well, you got to remember everything I own is in this. Right. So all my clothing, all my tools, it's very, very comfortable for me. Perfect of, size. A lot of people like RVing because they have to adopt a minimalist lifestyle. Did you have to make any changes like that? No, we sold everything. That's a big change. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's the hardest thing for people to do if they want to go out on the road is to figure out what to do with all their stuff. But once you get rid of all this stuff, it's liberating. That's exactly right. You don't realize how much so, stuff you accumulate over the years. You have no idea. We didn't know for sure it was going to happen. So we rented a garage and put stuff in the garage that we thought, definitely, we're going to need this. I came back three years later after Paul passed away the garage which we've been paying faithfully every month i didn't even know it was in there that's right they had no idea in fact i was surprised oh look at this anyway so we put it at it i just had a big yard sale got rid of all of it motored on are there any tools or equipment that you have found to be particularly helpful or useful in your work camping and RVing lifestyle Mm, tool i have way too many tools <laughs> you should always have an impact driver Always, you should always have a full set of tools, screwdrivers, torque set. I mean, I can't arm yourself before you go. You can never have enough half inch wrenches. And that's because you have to do all of the RV repairs by yourself, or you choose to do right. that because you have I the did. skill well, and ability. Mm -hmm. Right. But you can't afford it. It's 100, 115 bucks an hour. Like I would call it mobile tech. They're at least 100 bucks an hour because you can't take an RV and you live in. They'll keep it for months. What do you, you know, where do you, where right. do you live? Right. So mobile techs are the best. Oh, I can't say enough about how great they are. You just call them up. They come out to you. They honor warranties, all that stuff. But yeah, but uh, at a hundred bucks an hour, you gotta learn to fix your own stuff. Do you have problems getting service on the road with the mobile technicians? Nope. I have never had a problem. Sometimes I have to wait a few days. But there's, a, there's, I'm probably going to kick myself in the rear for saying this, but there's not much in an RV that you can't do without or substitute for a short period of time. If your furnace doesn't work, you can go buy an electric heater. Little substitutes like that. Mm -hmm. How long do you plan to be in Texas? At least through the next three months. Okay. And then I think I'm going to Colorado for this summer. That'll be nice. At another refuge up there? 
Yes, sir. Yes. What part um, of the state is this one located in? Beats me. I can't remember. <laughs> is it in it's the mountains? Really, yes. Okay. It's through a mountain pass. Oh, that'd be fun. That'd be spectacularly beautiful. It is. Yeah. And having a big old truck, it's easy to pull through the mountains and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not such a big deal. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's it's only about eight hours from where I'm going to be, eight hour journey from where I'll be this spring. So I'll be up, up around um, Canyon, Texas this spring. Okay. And so it's only an eight hour drive from there. Do you have any advice for people who are considering becoming a work camper? Yeah, I got, well, you know, one really good piece of advice that I can give you is don't waste your time if you don't like what you're doing. If people are mean to you, don't stay. Pull up your wheels. You're on wheels for a reason. Get Just go. <laughs> it's not worth putting up with crappy people and bad attitudes just to work camp because there's a billion jobs out there. You can do everything from work on a ranch to work in a campground to work at Christmas harvest to pick lettuce. I mean, there's a million things you can do as a worker, and there's no reason to be in a situation that you hate. Just pick up your wheels and go. You don't have to use them for reference, and there's no big network out there. Have you had problems you that you've had to deal with like that? Yeah, I've had. There were there were two jobs, both working in private campgrounds, where it was a. Um, I signed up for maintenance, so I'm a maintenance work camper, and I do know plumbing, I know electric, I know all sorts of stuff. I'm pretty handy, and they stuck me in the office, and I said, I, I'm not an office person. They said, well, we don't. The guys here do all that kind of work, and that was like the next day I was gone. I said, that's not what I signed up for, so get, get your job on good writing. Right. You know, I didn't because I was new at this, but. You know, I said, that's not what I signed up for. And I said, well, this is all we have. So I was like, all right, bye. Other people have told me that these kind of volunteer positions, they are so appreciative of the work campers that it's a kind of a different atmosphere to work in. Would you agree with that? Oh, you have no idea. Yes. you're. Sometimes you're replacing an entire person. You know, some of these states, their parks and things, they're so underfunded that they can't get they can't hire people at the wage that they hire. Mm -hmm. And man, you can come in there and you can help them like, like you wouldn't believe. Now they don't rely on you. Like they're still trying to hire someone, but they don't make great money. So you come in there and you do your 24 hours a week or whatever it is they ask you to do. And man, they'll, they'll invite you to Christmas. You know, <laughs> they'll throw you a party every Friday. They'll buy your beer. You name it. Yes. They are extremely appreciative of you. But are the RV parking spots nice? Yes. Except for one thing, which you can't help, but in basic campgrounds, the host spot is almost always by the bathroom because that's where the plumbing is for sewer. You know, if it doesn't have full hookups all the way throughout, you're always by the bathroom. So you have a dog like I do who's nosy. Every time someone goes to the bathroom, she parks. <laughs> so that's that's one thing but otherwise no there's just do your research before you go make sure your rig fits there's a lot of kids older older like national parks you can't take rig my size in there right those kind of parks are rather restrictive you can't go above usually 30 maybe a maximum of 35 feet right and they, well they're older they never they've never rebuilt or they're not new a lot of the state parks were built in the last 20 years or rebuilt so their sites are bigger, they're a little wider, they're a little more private, not so much a parking lot. Have you had any challenges as a single woman or being by yourself? Not in Texas. <laughs> not in Texas. Boy, how do you get up in the Midwest? And it's it's a different story. It is what it is. Sometimes it's just, they're just people aren't used to seeing a female by themselves. And sometimes it's, it's amusing. Have you ever felt uncomfortable in any situations? Hmm. Well, a few. What do you do? Right. I got a dog. I've got like that one extra thing right there. And I'm just always an alert person anyway. Just 30 years of bartending makes you watch everything around you. You always know what's going on. So would you recommend this lifestyle for other single women? Oh, sure. Absolutely. There's, there's groups out there where all these single women get together. That's right. They know how to Go party. Ahead. What is that? I think it's called Ladies on the Fly. 
sisters on the fly. Mm-hmm. Just to take you. Yes. Boy, do they have a ball. Yep. And girl camper and has a all, bunch. Mm-hmm. They're all little females out there. Not necessarily full time, but only they, they have a lot of fun. How can people connect with you if they'd like to ask your advice or just to follow what you're doing? Well, I'm on Facebook. That's how you found me or okay. I found you or. That's right. However, that's the best thing. Otherwise, I'm, you know, right now, I'm absolutely lucky that this call lasted so long. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> most of my calls drop after 15 or 20 minutes or some strange thing happens and the internet goes wild or it doesn't happen. That's funny. Well, thank you very much, Heather. I really appreciate your time today. This is great advice that you've given. And it sounds like you are having the time of your life out there all by yourself. I'm having a ball, Greg. Send them all out here. We got room. Very good. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Have a good day. I really enjoyed speaking with Heather Spain about her work camping and RVing experiences. She enjoys work camping with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because the agency does not operate a lot of campgrounds. That means Heather isn't cleaning up after a lot of people. Rather, she's involved in conservation efforts to preserve the property for others to enjoy on day trips. A former forklift operator, Heather is comfortable driving heavy equipment, which is used to clear brush, dig up culverts, and even pave roads. The best part about working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is that she gets to stay on the property with a 60,000-acre backyard. She also gets a free RV site, her utilities are paid for, and sometimes she gets a few meals, all in exchange for 24 hours of volunteer work every week. Nor does Heather have a set schedule. When she arrives at a refuge, the staff hands her a set of keys and gives her a list of things they'd like her to do. Then Heather gets to set her own schedule. She can opt to work a little bit every day, or work three eight-hour days and take four days off. That gives Heather plenty of time to explore an area before she moves on. Heather was at a refuge in Northeast Texas when she was interviewed, but was planning on moving to a refuge along the Gulf of Mexico to begin another assignment shortly. Another reason why Heather likes working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is that she doesn't really need to worry about submitting a resume and waiting to be interviewed or selected for a job. She basically contacts the refuge, explains her qualifications, and asks if her services are needed. It's a yes or no answer. Then Heather can plan accordingly or look for another place that can use her skills during the time she'd like to be in the area. Heather encourages other women to venture out on their own too. There are a lot of groups where women are beers and she can usually figure out what to do to fix any problem she encounters. Heather was honest in saying she really wished she and her husband had ventured out to enjoy the RV lifestyle much earlier than they did. People can connect with Heather on Facebook. Today's episode is brought to you by the featured employers at WorkCamper.com. These work camper employers have taken an extra step to share some photos and detailed information about their work camper programs. Opportunities exist for solos, couples, and families, whether they are full-time, part-time, seasonal, and even long-term jobs. Some are income opportunities, and others involve volunteering at locations throughout the United States. Go to workcamper.com forward slash FE to meet the featured employers today. Employers who are seeking to hire work campers can learn about the benefits of year-round recruiting by becoming a featured employer. More information about featured employers is available at workcamper.com forward slash FE details. That's all I have for this week's show. Next time I'll be speaking with a woman in her 30s who lives full-time in a van she converted herself and works remotely for her employer. I'll have that interview on the next episode of The Work Camper Show. Thanks for listening.